I'm not sure about polite name calling. I think we'll leave that by the by. Uh, the next item of business is a debate on motion 6186 in the name of Peter Chapman on agriculture. Can I members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Peter Chapman to speak to and move the motion. Mr Chapman, eight minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest. Just over a year ago, I remember reading the Audit Scotland report into the CAP IT system, and I have never read such a damning document in all my years in business as that one. It showed a government stru governance structure riddled with incompetence, a budget wildly out of control, and no prospect of getting the additional functionality that was promised. At the time, the SNP government seemed to be absolutely committed to getting this fiasco under control. We had Fergus Ewing in the chamber apologising to farmers and promising that action would be taken. I remember it well, he said, I will get in a boot it. Now, Cabinet Secretary, I'm not sure if you have got in a boot it, but you are certainly in it. <laughs> this year's update from Audit Scotland is predictably not much better. The Scottish Government is at risk of £60 million in fines from the EU, but the First Minister does not seem to be overly concerned. President, presiding officer, it is amazing that after all the careful work that Audit Scotland has put in and their cal careful calculations that the First Minister thinks that she knows best and she reckons that it probably won't be that much, so why should we get worked up over it? it yep. Cabinet Secretary. I thank Mr Chapman for giving way. I mean, obviously I recognise that last year the Auditor General did state that the range of, of uh, uh, costs would be in the region of 40 to 125 million. But does he recall that we've made it clear that the actual uh, estimated penalties, so far as we can ascertain them at the current time, is actually 5 million? And therefore, the factual position is substantially less bleak than has been painted. Peter Chapman. Well, but the interesting thing is that it, it came down to five million because we've got a, a, an, a, a, an extra three months to pay the monies out till, till the end of October. If that's going to happen this year, then maybe the 60 million will be a different figure again. But that is the figure that Audit Scotland have come up with in their report, and that is the figure that I can legitimately use today. And it is indicative of the shocking complacency that defines the attitude of this government to what has been the worst cash crisis in a generation for our farmers. And the response to that is no doubt that there are many staff working hard to get this system going as soon as possible and that IT experts are now getting to grips with the system. Unfortunately, as reported by Audit Scotland, there is a risk that as, as and when contractors leave, there is an inadequate procedure to ensure that knowledge is transferred. Now, just another of the risks highlighted by this report. Now, as we speak, out in the local area offices, we have teams working overtime and under huge pressure to deliver for our farmers. But whose job is being made impossible by this faulty, overpriced IT system? Fergus Ewan regularly sings their praises and I totally agree. They have been doing their absolute best and have had to endure angry exchanges with farmers who are at their Please wits' sit down, end Mr. Whiteman. because they can't. Sorry. Mr. Whiteman was asking if he'd take an intervention, I'm but sorry, he didn't, didn't respond, realize. so he can't have two members standing at the same time. I didn't unless you wish to do that. I missed that. Sorry, President Officer. I'm, I'm going to carry on. As we speak, in local area office, we have teams working overtime under huge pressure to deliver to our farmers. Now, Fergus Ewan regularly f sings their praises, and I totally agree. They have been doing their absolute best, and they have had to endure angry exchanges with farmers who are at their wit's end because they can't pay their bills. But staff are working with their hands tied behind their backs. And Cabinet Secretary, it is your fault. I know farmers across Scotland realise that frontline staff are working their socks off every day to ensure their payments are made as quickly as possible. And I have actually heard that in some offices staff are being asked to cancel holidays and take on yet more hours to, as we rapidly approach the June 30th deadline for payments. 
I've heard you this time. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I helped you, I think, Mr. Whiteman. Mr. Whiteman. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, Mr. Chapman, for taking intervention. Can Mr. Chapman confirm whether the £101,000 in 2015 and the £76,452 uh, in 2016 received by Peter Chapman and company was received on time or not? Just bear with me a minute, Mr. Chapman. Sit down, please. Totally inappropriate. It was all about his own pain. I think that's a matter of whether you may wish or wish not to respond to, Mr Chapman. It was totally inappropriate and I will not respond to it. <laughs> of course, this brings us to another of the serious issues that this report makes clear that still needs further work. The Scottish Government is required by EU regulations to make 95% of payments by the end of June. And there is great, uh, a great deal of uncertainty about whether that can still be achieved or if farmers will be left waiting yet again. Frankly, I don't believe it can be achieved, but maybe the Cabinet Secretary can reassure us today on this subject. Or is he intending to ask for another extension to the payment window from the EU? So hopefully Mr Ewan will be able to answer that question when he speaks today. And even if that can be achieved, it is still the case that farmers are punished far too harshly for minor errors. Let me give one example. A constituent of mine who forgot to attach maps for this year's greening application, but who did all the work, had all the acres in place, and did all, had all the relevant information, is facing a possible £16,000 penalty. And what makes the situation worse is that, is that last year a map wasn't required for this scheme. So, assuming his income is only 12,500, as is the average for 2016, even an SNP minister should be able to see that this leaves him in the red. His whole year's profit gone at a stroke because of one simple mistake. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can explain why he can make mistakes but still keep his job, but my constituents makes a minor one like this and can lose all his income. Or is it the case that stronger for Scotland simply means more support for beleaguered ministers while leaving struggling farmers in the lurch? One would think that, this, that after this list of failures, there might be some good to take away from all of this, that the worst is behind us. I'm sorry to say that is not the case. In addition to the issues plaguing this system every day, there is a real risk to the payment process from the absence of a backup system. And this was highlighted a year ago by Audit Scotland, and nothing has been done. If a ransomware attack like that which hit our NHS and created havoc around the world just a few weeks ago were to be carried out in the CAP IT system, it would be cataclysmic. I am staggered that the SNP have done nothing, nothing at all to put in basic safeguards, and I shudder to think how we would recover from such an attack. And let's not forget, rural communities will have to go through this fiasco all over again, as the system is not expected to be fully compliant until 2018 at the earliest. That means for nearly half their time in government, the SNP have failed to get to grips with this issue, and assuming that the system works by 2018, the SNP will have spent five years not delivering on a system for farmers, not delivering vital money on time into the places that need it most. Presiding officer, this government has spent its time apologising, explaining away and excusing their failure to work for rural Scotland. The question is, can we ever expect them to take some positive action and get on with finally fixing their mess? I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Mr Chapman. I call on Fergus Ewing, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to move amendment 6186.4. Six minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's always good to have the opportunity to debate agriculture in this chamber. But it is disappointing that with so much potential for debate on this topic, the Conservatives have focused narrowly on one specific issue. I recognise absolutely the importance of this issue. There is significant work still required. The response plan published today makes that clear. And while improvements uh, have been made, Resolving the outstanding problems remains my foremost priority. I want to focus my time, however, on the role of agriculture now uh, and in the future and on its positives. Agriculture plays a crucial role in our rural economy. There are 
around 52,000 farm holdings, covering 5.6 million hectares. Barley is the largest crop, and there are 600,000 breeding cattle and 2.6 million breeding ewes. Since 2007, we have injected over 1,600 million pounds into the rural economy, supporting over 21,000 projects. That, presiding officer, is in addition to over 400 million pounds direct annual support to farmers and crofters. Since 2015, we have supported 130 young and new farmers with £7 million in funding. Between 2007 and 2013, an estimated near 32,000 jobs were created. And for every £1 spent, £2.30 was generated. Today, presiding officer, I announced the latest round of food processing and manufacturing grants worth £5.8 million to support butchers, food processors, pie manufacturers and farmers to invest in equipment, products, facilities and jobs all over Scotland. The success of our agricultural sector was demonstrated only this week with the publication of the most recent food and drink export statistics. These showed that the value of exports has grown by 10% compared to the same period just last year. Those statistics also make plain the importance of membership of the EU single market, and indeed with the EU being the largest market out with the UK for Scottish food and drink, accounting for 70% or 1,000 million pounds of our food exports alone. Planning officer, all of this shows the precarious position we now find ourselves in, an extreme Brexit, which would remove all the benefits that agriculture in Scotland currently enjoys, would have a devastating impact. This is why Scotland must be included in the Brexit negotiations. The reasons are not political, they are practical. We must protect the interests of our agricultural sector. To deliver the best possible environmental and product people on the land, as we debated in respect of crofting just yesterday with uh, people such as Mr Finney of Like Mind, to produce more food for ourselves and for export abroad and to support development of the sector in the future, then we need to maintain our share of funding and also our access both to people and markets. And it's important that we look to the future, presiding officer. Sustainability means growing markets. The recent achievement of BSE negligible risk status now gives us potential to do that for our quality meat sector. It also means supporting environmental enhancement. To date, the Agri-Environment Scheme has invested £99 million in over 1,500 projects, covering everything from enhancing biodiversity to protecting the water environment. Farmers, presiding officer, are increasingly innovating and collaborating to find their own solutions, such as through monitor farms and cooperatives. Indeed, I visited uh, in North Keswick, north of Inverness, Highland Grains just last Friday. Presiding officers, farmers and crofters already play a key role as the custodians of our land. They help to shape and also to protect this most fundamental and natural asset. In the future, there is more they and we all can and should do to achieve the best possible environmental and productivity outcomes. And these are not conflicting aims, conflicting aims, presiding officer, but complementary ones. EU funding, or its equivalent, is vital for the continued viability and sustainability of Scottish agriculture. Our landscape, our needs and our priorities are different from the rest of the UK, as evidenced by 85% of our land being less favourable as opposed to only 15% in England. And this is especially so for hill farmers, as evidenced by the testimony of many hill farmers and crofters at the two summits I recently held in Lanark and in Dingwall. We must receive a 16.5% share of funding, future funding for agriculture, and we expect the same amount of funding to be available in future as now. And the power to decide what and how to invest funding to achieve sustainable outcomes must rest in Scotland. But we will only get agreement on the next steps, presiding officer, through discussions based on mutual respect and by taking a new cross-party, all-government, four-nation approach 
to Brexit uh, negotiations. And in that objective to conclude, Presiding Officer, uh, I undertake to work as I always try to do with all other parties in this Parliament. I move the amendment in my name. I thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call on Rhoda Grant to speak to move amendment 6186.1. Five minutes or thereabouts, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It would appear that there's no end in sight for this fiasco. The Cabinet Secretary in his first days in office said that it would be his top priority. Over a year later, it appears that we're no further forward. There's a number of issues at stake here. The impact on the public purse, the impact on farmers and crofters, and the impact on the rural economy. Can I turn firstly to our farmers and crofters? They have experienced difficulty in making claims, delays in receiving any money, either substantial payments or loans. And it has caused them to postpone future plans for development. All the while, the Scottish Government put out press releases praising their own investment in the, real, the rural economy. They're simply adding insult to injury. I've spoken to people who are afraid to claim for a loan as they're not clear under the new system what their entitlement is and they can't risk an overpayment. Sorry, Ms Grant, somebody's, somebody's got a friend calling them when they shouldn't be having their phone on. Sorry, just continue. It was spoiling your speech. <laughs> I've you. located the culprit. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You went bright red. I thought it was you. <laughs> You'll just have to stop blushing, Mr. Carlo. Sorry, Ms. Grant. On you go. <laughs> Indeed. In in interrupting my speech is fine. Giving me the time back would be excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've spoken to people whose development plans have been badly undermined and have had to shelve plans to make their businesses more viable, and that will impact on the rural, rural economy for years to come. The knock-on effects from the fiasco will mean that families are losing their livelihoods and going out of business very briefly. Cap Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President. I'm absolutely aware of the difficulties facing individual farmers and crofters, but would Rhoda Grant at least recognise that the loan schemes which I have instituted in last year, which in November, earlier than the normal payment window of the 1st December, at the beginning of November, injected around £275 million into the rural economy to those farmers and crofters, and that was at least a pragmatic uh, and efficient act. Rhoda Grant. Nobody is arguing that the loans should not have been paid. Indeed, they were a necessity to be paid to allow people to continue to function. Unfortunately, they weren't the full payment, which means that a lot of people have had to put their plans on a back burner. And those plans were effective in making those businesses carry on. And indeed, um, those businesses th that depend on the rural economy have also suffered because of that. Because even if they do manage to stay afloat, they're facing hardship for years to come, paying off debts racked up as a result. And even if it were fixed tomorrow, the consequences would last a long time. Money and resource need to be uh, put back in to support farmers and crofters as they try and pick themselves up again. And it's vital, but once again, it's public money spent in the fallout of this mess. And the Scottish Government needs to take responsibility for it rather than shrug their Teflon shoulders. This fiasco also impacts on the larger rural economy. Those who support farmers and crofters, people who make improvements to buildings, fences and the like. These maintenance and investment projects are the things that have stopped and small businesses are closing because of it. And it hits already fragile uh, rural economies. And it also delays recovery because those skills are lost in the rural economy. Far from investing in a rural economy, the Scottish Government have let them down. And Fergus Ewing might say the system was not his choice. The purchase of the system happened under Richard Lockett's tenure, and that's correct. But he's had a year to sort it out, and it's not, he has not even begun to make headway. Let me be very clear, it's not a criticism of the regional office staff who've been working long and hard to try and get payments out and to help claimants. It's a failure of management. The fault ultimately lies with the Scottish Government who sourced the system and indeed employed the contractor. Was due process carried out to make sure they were up to the task? 
I've seen the secret report and it doesn't give me confidence that the system will ever work. And I wonder if it'll just simply limp on until Brexit renders it redundant. However, it's still costing the public purse. Amendments and changes to the system need to be paid for by the public as to the loans required to keep farmers and crofters in business. How long will the European Commission continue to overlook its failures with Brexit? There is no need for them to keep us on side. Penalties will add to the cost of the whole project. At a time of austerity, it seems absolutely counterproductive that the taxpayer should be shelling out, paying for this government's failure. And I acknowledge that the Cabinet Secretary today has published um, the, the conclusions, the executive summary of the Fujitsu report. But I think it's time that they are totally open with people to the full extent of this and publish the full report so everyone can see what's happened. I believe... Do I have time? Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm most grateful. Would, would Roder Grant acknowledge that the reason why we cannot and we have not published the full report is commercial confidentiality, but also cyber security, and that to do so would risk breaching cyber security. Oh Rudy Grant. And that, to an extent, um, makes my point, because if the report is so damning that it would call into question cyber security, it explains to people exactly what is happening. I think we need a new system. Um, I'm not reassured this one will ever work. It was a vanity project and it's now time to admit defeat. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Ms Grant. Now move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, a little leeway uh, if you take interventions. A call Finlay Carson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wanted to start, if I may, by setting out a few facts and stats on agriculture in Scotland. Some 80% of Scotland's land mass is under agricultural production making it the industry the biggest de determinant of the landscape we see around us. Scotland's farmers, crofters and growers produce output worth around 2.9 billion a year. Around 60, 67,000 people are directly employed in agriculture in Scotland, and this represents about 8% of the rural workforce. It means that agriculture is the third largest employer in rural Scotland after the service, uh, uh, service and public sectors. It's estimated that a further 360,000 jobs, that's one in 10 of all Scottish jobs, are dependent on agriculture. All of this highlights the important role agriculture plays in Scotland's economy, its landscape and its people, and the fantastic job our farming community is making despite this SNP government. Deputy Presiding Officer, for far too long, this government has been failing our rural communities. I do have a degree of sympathy with the Cabinet Secretary in that I accept and acknowledge that Fergus Ewan inherited this dog dinner's mess of an IT system for, from his predecessor back in 2016. And at the time, he said all the right things. He did apologise to the farmers and committed to getting it sorted. And at the end of the day, that is where we need to get to. However, the Cabinet Secretary has totally failed to manage farmers' expectations leaving them with a distrust of him and his SNP government and total confusion and uncertainty across the sector. Our farmers and crofters are paying the price for this SNP government's continued mismanagement of the common agricultural payment system. Last week, Audit Scotland published a report looking into the failed system and their findings were not complimentary. It found that difficulties encountered in previous years have, have had a significant impact in the processing of current payments to date, the programme has not delivered value for money. EU penalties, and I quote, of up to 60 million are possible for late payments. They are their figures, not mine. And the possibility, the possibly the most damning of all, it's likely that the rural payment system will not be functioning as anticipated until 2018 at the earliest. So a computer system that has cost the Scottish government 178 million to set up, which was 75% over budget, requires additional costs to set up, not to mention potential fines, and it probably won't work until 2018 or maybe later. Not only have this government failed to get to grips with the mess, they risk being accused of attempting to cover up any further criticism. The Scottish Government have not released a report by Fujitsu which looked into the IT system, claiming it was commercially sensitive, and I'm afraid I don't accept uh, the cyber security excuse. Those MPs and, uh, on the REC committee who were privileged enough... I will. 
Cabinet Secretary. I mean, we saw Presiding Officer recently and what happened to the NHS when there were breaches in its IT system. The advice that I have had as the Cabinet Secretary for the rural economy from the Chief Officer is that to do so would risk similar cyber security breaches. Does Mr Carson not agree that given that that is the case, it would be an act of sheer irresponsibility if I were to release information which could threaten to breach the cyber security of our CAP IT system? Mr Carson. Uh, thank you for that. I think the, the horse is uh, possibly bolted because as far as I understand the, the report has been leaked and I, I don't know what that says about security or whether it's cyber security or not. Indeed, the Scottish Government officials confirmed that the report needed remedial action and that there were system defects. It is totally unacceptable for any department and government to attempt to, behind, to, to hide behind commercial sensitivity. However, I do urge the Cabinet Secretary in good faith to consider publishing a redacted version of the report. Be transparent, allow proper scrutiny, scrutiny and let's get this computer system into a fit for purpose state. That's what the farming communities of Scotland want and that's what they deserve. Where are we now? As of 22nd of May, around 1,700 Pillar 2 payments with a total value of 14 million were still outstanding. Indeed, the delay to start Pillar 1 payments has increased the risk that the deadline of the end of June will not be met. The fact is, it's not so much just about meeting targets. This is about businesses being able to manage their cash flows. Put simply, it's about farmers' livelihoods. It means farmers can't pay his debtors on time. It means they don't have the funds to replace a piece of equipment that's broken down. It means they can't pay the staff. It means they can't make prudent investment and their business is required to build a sustainable future. And there, and there you must conclude. My Thank last you very much. Point. No, I've given you an extra minute. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Claudia Beamish. Please, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I should start by declaring a relevant interest. The National Farmers Union uh, provide uh, me with a uh, Scottish farmer leader at no cost. The cover price is £3.50. Uh, thank you very much, National Farmers Union. Helps me stay in touch, and I'll come back to that. I also declare I've uh, registered agricultural holding of under two hectares from which I derive no income. The leader helps us all stay in touch. A different publication, Farmers Weekly, in its 10th of February edition, caught the situation in which farming finds itself in relation to the subject farm payments. It said, the department's record of failure when developing systems to support subsidy payments to farmers does not inspire confidence in its ability to cope with the challenges with Brexit that lie ahead. Continued, at the same time, taxpayers continue to be hit in the pocket by financial penalties arriving, arising from the government's failure to deliver the scheme property, properly. Now, the penalties to which the uh, Farmers Weekly refers are half a billion pounds. The failures it describes are, of course, the Tory failures of the cap payment system in England. It doesn't let us in Scotland off the hook that they are also in difficulties, very far from it. But it allows us to compare the Tory rhetoric here with their record south of the border. And it's not one that much favours my colleagues uh, on the benches to my left. The chair of the Westminster Public Accounts Committee, chaired by a Labour MP with a Tory MP, Richard Bacon, as deputy chairman, was withering on his party's record there. In fact, Bacon has even written a book called Conundrum, on the nature and causes of overspending, delays and failures in his government schemes and the failures of other governments. In contrast, here we have a government that is fessed up and has acted uh, upon legitimate concerns. A loan scheme introduced to protect the cash flows for farmers. In England, no comparable action. Today's motion asks us to note Audit Scotland's June findings. Let's just do that. It says in the audit report, significant changes to leadership brought renewed effort to respond to risks. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. It continues, online applications for 2017 opened on time in the 15th, on the 15th of March and no major system problems were noted in the application period. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you for all the hard-working staff at ARE. Now, none of this should be news to Mr Chapman or to me. Uh, we were both present at a parliamentarians meeting with uh, NFUS members, which took place at Thainston Mark the 28th of April. 
And we both heard confirmation from active farmers that the application system was working and usable. Doesn't mean the whole system's working, but the bit that farmers interact, it was working. We also heard the members uh, in his that last farm minute, incomes, Mr. Chapman. Uh, had declined, and we know the serious pressures there are. I welcome assurance from the UK government that funding for CAP will continue to 2020, but in the light of withholding over 100 million of convergence funding, I'm a bit sceptical about the outcome. Today's Queen's speech at Westminster says they hope to maintain the scope of devolved decision-making powers after exit. Intensive discussion consultation with devolved administrations is needed. But there's an agricultural bill has been proposed. I'm going to be quite radical. Why don't we have a joint committee between this parliament and the parliament down there uh, to look at that uh, particular bill? Uh, let me uh, just say on an important point as a computer person on backup systems, Peter Chapman's entirely wrong. It's only the heritage, the legacy systems that are not backed up, not the new CAPI system, and all the data was confirmed it would be okay. Let me end with the farming leader. Uh, July's edition, the one I have here, 66 pages, not a single word on CAP IT or any of the failures. Farmers have moved on. Government is moving on with them. And now you, Tories and now are you out must of move on, again. Mr. Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carson, you wish to say something? I'd just like to put on record that I failed to uh, declare that I was a member of the NFU and I wish to do that at this point. Excellent. That's now on the record. I call Claudia Beamish to follow by John Finney. Ms Beamish, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. What a pity we have had to rightly focus on the CAP system delivery today in the Tory motion and our amendment instead of on the future of agriculture more broadly. It is extraordinary that we're having to debate the CAP delivery system yet again in this chamber. The abject failure to fix so many of these issues has put our farmers under prolonged financial pressure and it's deplorable that they continue to face the price of this government's mess. In February 2016, a very desperate point for farmers in Scotland, I met with members of NFUS Forth and Clyde on farm at Crawford John in my region. At that time, many spoke of the stress they were under and actually raised concerns with, about the mental health of well-being of farmers and their families. At that meeting, I heard of seed merchants suffering loss of business, and farmers struggling to meet higher purchase payments. And still, this very day, Tom French, Vice Chair of the Clydesdale NFUS branch, has discussed with me the restricted cash flow difficulties and the obvious effects of the confidence in the supply trade and on farmers' accountability, uh, accountancy ability. Farmers in my region have told me extended credit arrangements in the supply uh, chain have contributed to several businesses downsizing and some stopping trading altogether. The, the government's cap failings took a huge toll not just on farmers awaiting payment but on the whole rural economy. Rural representatives well know the variety of factors that have made rural economies more fragile than urban counterparts through the years and this government imposed disruption had a serious knock-on effect. In March 2016, the then Cabinet Secretary told this chamber, are we going to ensure that all the payments get out? Of course we are. Since then, the current Cabinet Secretary has repeatedly assured us on behalf of the Scottish Government that, and I quote, we are fixing it. And here we are today, with some I understand locally of the 2015 payments still outstanding in an uneconomical system riddled with problems. It is heavily disappointing. Can I just um, continue this point, please? to learn that the function at, yeah, all right, I'll take it at that point, yes. Cabinet Secretary. I, I'm extremely grateful to Claudia Beamish for giving away issues a short time. C could I just point out, as a matter of fact, that we have actually completed 99.9% .9 of the Pillar 1 payments from last year. Ms Beamish. I'm afraid uh, cabinet the Cabinet Secretary makes that point, that's no comfort to my constituents. It is heavily disappointing to learn that the functionality of the process of the, of the Pillar 2 claims had to be deprioritised in favour of Pillar 1, important as it is. Furthermore, the integration of the remaining Pillar 2 schemes with the rural payment system was removed from the programme scope. It is chaos and, and so discouraging for farmers looking to invest in agri-environment and forestry schemes. I find it concerning that the Scottish Government still not has, has still not established a disaster recovery arrangement for the whole of the CAP payment process. 
These systems are at risk, and the Scottish Government's reassurances are no comfort without proper testing and plans. We must uh, commend the staff who continue to work through challenging circumstances. Anyone can empathise with the prospect of facing a day at work with impending deadlines and backlogs of work. The level of pressure is enormous. And the Audit Scotland further update noted that, I quote, the time pressure the programme was working under and the decision to make payments quicker had meant some governance practices such as system documentation and quality controls have been sacrificed. Staff should not be working under this kind of pressure. This level is unacceptable and the structures and processes of the work environment should be monitored closely. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will comment on this. The Cabinet Secretary said he would fix this mess and effective delivery is long overdue. How much longer does rural Scotland have to wait? Uh, thank you. Uh, strict four minutes now, please. John Finney, followed by Mike Rumbles. Mr Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I have no problem noting the findings of the Audit Scotland report. I think it accurately reflects the current situation. Much of what we heard, of course, doesn't accurately reflect what was in the report, and I think we had the appropriate balance from uh, Stuart Stevenson there. Uh, IT project in uh, disarray not that I'm accepting the present situation as one of disarray, is not news in the public sector. What's important is the scrutiny that takes place. And I would like to, in the very short time I have, talk about uh, the Rural Economy Connectivity Committee scrutiny. I think we, there's no doubt there's a problem being identified. Has it been acknowledged? Well, I heard, heard it acknowledged today, and it's certainly acknowledged in the Scottish Government's amendment and repeated remarks in, in previous debates we've had. We then should be asking the question, is it the result of neglect? No. Is it the result of a woeful act? No. Is there a lack of oversight on this issue? Well, quite clearly Audit Scotland do and, and have done in relation to this what they do across the public sector, and that's quite rightly vigorously scrutinised what's happened there. Did we get weekly up, uh, updates um, on the rural economy connectivity at the state of payments? Um, what, of course, we're interested in is the mechanisms put in place to ameliorate any problems, and we have heard about the commendable staff effort, and I think it's gratifying to hear a, a range of members talk about that, and the loan scheme. Is anything perfect? No. But I think that was a very positive step. The previous system wasn't perfect, and here I dare suggest that future systems won't be perfect either. It is about uh, uh, understanding. I have to say I don't have sufficient IT uh, knowledge to, to, to comment in detail about things, but if, if an expert tells me there's issues of uh, security, I, I, I'm inclined to listen, I have to say. Um, but the problem is, of course, that the current system of subsidy, subsidies is overly compl complicated, and that has created part of the administrative burden. And it's why the development of the IT uh, system was so problematic. But I have to say, a lot of this is distracting what the real challenge is to Scottish agriculture. And it's not the sorting of a, a, a computer system. It is the long-term implications of Scottish agriculture outside the European Union. Um, now, the UK Government has promised to maintain the current cap funding until 2020, but it's no published plans beyond that. And indeed, there's no guarantee that IT system being debated today will deliver any post-Brexit subsidy scheme which deviates from the existing cap model. It's Friday will be one year since the EU referendum, 12 weeks since uh, Article 50 was originally triggered. Um, and this, saw the start, this week saw the start of official negotiations with Europe. Um, what are we going to replace CAP with? Um, I think that uh, needs to be discussed, it needs to be discussed, it needs to be debated, it needs to be scrutinised and not behind closed doors. I think there has to be collaborative and working, indeed I believe there will be collaborative working between uh, Westminster and Holyrood on this, but focusing so heavily on an IT system specifically designed to deliver CAP, we risk uh, tying ourselves into a, a like-for-like -right replacement of CAP and a fail to address the inadequacies and complexities of the existing system. Um, business as usual for CAP will be a missed opportunity. Area-based payments, and that's the bulk of Pillar 1, um, continue to reward land ownership rather than sustainable land use. That drives up la land prices, and it's one of the key barriers to further land reform. So the Scottish Green Party certainly wants to move forward on the principle of public money for public good. So in the short time uh, that's left, I want to say that leaving the EU provides an opportunity to simplify subsidy system and to assure best value for public money, public money for public good. And that will not necessarily result in cutting funding to crofters, of whom we don't hear terribly much, eh, farmers and rural businesses. But what's most important is that Scotland's voice is heard in these negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. A call Mike Rumbles to be followed by Jamie Halco johnson Mr Rumbles, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. 63,000 people are directly employed in agriculture 
in Scotland, but over one million people live and work in rural communities that benefit indirectly from European support for our agricultural industries. Now, I have another figure for you, Deputy Presiding Officer. One billion pounds. That's the value of EU support that has been due to Scottish farm businesses since the Scottish Government's debacle over basic payments began over two years ago. Now, that is money that those working on farms and crofts across the country plan to use years in advance to employ workers, rent and buy equipment and services, and buy seed and feed for the coming season. Despite the Scottish Government's refusal to make a full assessment of the damage to our rural economy, we are now starting to see the depth of their catastrophic handling of farm payments. Payments delayed by six months or more, a decrease of 48% of farm incomes, 6,000 farm businesses still to have their payments processed, a third of farms in Scotland operating at a loss, and over £100 million of support payments still sitting in the government's bank account. And I see that John Finney says, well, nothing's perfect. I've only got another three, two minutes, sorry. I have no doubt that the minister inherited a complete mess from his predecessor. But I'm also certain that more could have been done over the past year to right those wrongs. In the words of the recent Fujistu report, a report that the minister requested not be made public, but which was covered in the committee, many quality assurance and government's practices have been knowingly sacrificed. We said that in committee. Now, this afternoon, the Scottish Government have published parts of the Fujitsu report. Mr Ewing says, in his covering letter, that it's a fair and balanced synopsis of the report. It is, however, no such thing. Nowhere in that report does it actually say, in this report, that many quality assurance and governance practices have been knowingly sacrificed. If you read this travesty of a synopsis of a report, everyone will see that it is not a balanced report. And I, for one, refused the private or secret briefing that Mr Ewing offered to the committee because I think it is wrong. This should be in the public domain and it is completely wrong for the government to operate in this closed fashion. Over the past two years, this government has presided over a systematic and inept mishandling of vital support for a rural economy and shown a complete regard, disregard for our rural communities. When he was first appointed as the Minister for Rural Economy, Fergus Ewing told this chamber that there would be no repeat of the 2015-16 cab debacle. And I quote from his speech, the farming industry needs to have confidence in the payment timetable, in the payment timetable, and that we will do what we say. There must be no repeat, no repeat of the problems that were faced in 2015-16. Can the minister honestly say that he has delivered on his promise? Can any observer say that the government have delivered on his promises? I wonder whether our farmers and the Scottish taxpayer will agree. Millions paid out in fines for payment errors, with more fines of up to £60 million on the way for missing this year's deadline for payments. A deadline which is only nine days away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rumbles. I now call Jamie Halcro Johnson to be followed by Emma Harper. This is Mr. Halcro Johnson's first speech in the Scottish Parliament, and we welcome you to it, Mr. Halcro Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, can I declare, that, uh, declare an interest uh, as a partner in the farming business of J. Halcro Johnson and Sons, as well as the owner of a croft? Um, it's with great pride that I make my maiden speech um, as a member of this parliament and as a representative of the Highlands and Islands, an area which includes my own home of Orkney. And I'm particularly delighted that my parents have been able to make it here today. They have experienced, as I'm sure the families of all politicians do, the highs and lows of my uh, political involvement just as much as I have. And they've always been a very great support to me. Uh, it was actually my father who inspired me to uh, be interested in politics. And while we haven't always agreed politically, as a member of the Scottish Constitutional Co uh, Convention, he was part of the process that led to the Scottish Parliament coming into being. And I'm proud now to be a member of the Chamber that he and others helped bring about. I'd also like to pay tribute to my successor um, on the Highlands and Islands list, Douglas Ross, now the MP for Murray. His fantastic win there is testament to the hard work he has put in, first as a councillor and then as an MSP for that area. 
and it's a clear indication of the esteem in which he is held by local people in Murray. I know he'll continue to work hard for them as their MP, and I'll avoid using the term rising star, an, uh, 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 an accolade that uh, few politicians recover from. Uh, I know we all expect big things of him, though, in the future, and I look forward to working with him in my new role. Can I also thank David McGill, his team, and all those who have helped myself, and I'm sure I speak uh, from my colleague uh, Tom Mason as well, in making us both feel so welcome today and yesterday. While I'm a new member of this parliament, these surroundings are not unfamiliar to me, um, and it's great to see so many familiar faces amongst both the MSP and parliament staff. Between 2007 and two sorry, 2003 and 2007, I worked as a press officer and advisor to various Conservative MSPs, Ted Brocklebank, Brian Monteith, Bill Aitken, Mary Scanlon and Jamie McGregor. And I thank them all for the opportunities they gave me back then. And can I also congratulate Mary Scanlon on her recent award of a CBE, a fitting tribute to her contribution to political life in the Highlands and Islands and to this Parliament. And also to Jamie McGregor, who was recently elected as a councillor in Argyle and Butte and will continue to serve his constituents. When I last worked here, they were very different times for the Scottish Conservatives. The only wins we celebrated in Scotland were victories in the annual tug-of-war competition. Three years of undefeated champions, testament to the hard work and dedication put in by our team. And that was a team that, of course, includes, included the late and much-missed Alex Johnston. Alex and his wife Linda were always extremely supportive to me as a young and candidate standing in his first election. And I'm saddened that I won't be able to serve here with Alex as my colleague or with David McCletchie or David Petrie, two other Conservative parliamentar parliamentarians taken from us too soon. The area I now represent, the Highlands and Islands, is vast. The challenges it faces are many and diverse, and even within the agricultural sector, sector, the needs of someone farming in Shetland or in Orkney can be very different to the needs of someone farming in Murray or Rosher or Caithness. But a strong agricultural sector is vital for wherever you live in the Highlands and Islands. Even if someone is not directly involved in the sector, they'll likely know somebody who is. They're our friends, our family, our neighbours. Scotland produces some of the finest produce in the world, and the Highlands and Islands produces some of the finest produce in Scotland. But that needs to be supported and nurtured. It needs the proper transport links to get our food to market. It needs producers to receive a fair price for their goods. It needs local government and business to support local producers by sourcing and promoting local produce. And, of course, it needs rural payments paid on time. The Scottish Government's mismanagement of farm payments has meant real difficulties in the present and concerns for the future. It's left some farmers with severe cash flow problems and put financial pressure on the agricultural sector in general. The last few years have not been easy, but I do believe there's a bright future for our farmers and those who support the sector. And that is crucial if we want to attract the next generation to take up the mantle and be the farmers of tomorrow. As an MSP, I look forward to working with farmers, crofters, representative groups, producers and stakeholders across the Highlands and Islands over the next few years. I'd like to finish on how I hope politics may change in our country. Last week saw the anniversary of the murder of Joe Cox. The, set, the sentiments which have come to the fore since her death should be something we can all agree on. That often we as politicians agree on far more than that on which we disagree. I hope over the next few years we'll see a normalising of Scottish politics again, where our focus as parliamentarians can be on the needs of our constituents and not on the Constitution. How working together we can do better for them. Thank you. Well said, Mr Halko Johnson. I'll teach you about my pen on another occasion. Signal of one minute to go. I call it Emma Harper, the last speaker in the open debate. We then move to closing speeches. Um, thank you, President Officer. Before I, would, before I begin, I'd like to remind Chamber that I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Economy and Connectivity. And I'd like to offer congratulations to Jamie Harker Johnston for his first speech, 26 and a half hours since being sworn in, according to my partner sitting next to me. <laughs> I welcome the opportunity to discuss the CAP Futures programme and to acknowledge the difficulties and the challenges that delayed payments have caused the farming industry. We can't go back, we must go forward. And as the First Minister told Chamber last week, there is not a shred of complacency on the government's part with regards to tackling this issue and ensuring that the system delivers as farmers have a right to expect it to. 
In 2016, a number of countries had problems with making CAP payments on time, so much so that the European Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development announced an extension to the deadline. England went through its troubles with common agricultural policy back in 2006 and 2007, when it moved to a regionalised model. According to a recent report by the Public, Account Committee, the Public Accounts Committee examining delivery of the CAP in England, there are still significant failings in that system. The report concludes that DEFRA has failed to assess the effect of delayed subsidy payments on farmers and has not done enough to mitigate the implications. As noted in Audit Scotland's report, the CAP Futures programme has operated in a challenging external environment as EC requirements were not fully agreed before the programme needed to start. Additional system complications were created by decisions taken in the middle of 2014 to accommodate the industry's request to have three payment regions. Despite failings, the Cabinet Secretary has take, taken repeated measures to ensure that farmers do not lose out financially. Application periods have been extended to help maximise the number of farmers applying and giving them additional time to do so. Where it has been determined that meeting targets to pay farmers were not achievable, the Scottish Government has taken steps to minimise disruption by making payments in two stages, rather than waiting until the system was ready to dispense any money. Actually, I've only got four minutes, so I won't take any interventions. Less complex claims have been dealt with first to speed up the process and the Scottish Government used over £270 million of its own budget to pay farmers as speedily as possible by introducing interest-free loan schemes. Clearly, there is a lot more to do, but I welcome the fact that the updated report from Audit Scotland recognises a wee bit of the progress that has been made. I know that the Scottish Government will now carefully consider the findings in the context of the significant improvement activity that is underway. As the Cabinet Secretary states in his amendment, the biggest threat to Scottish agriculture remains the UK's departure from the EU, withdrawal from the CAP and the loss of membership of the single market, as the SNP will also focus on protecting farmers post-2020. I think that is actually one of the big focuses we need to have is that the, this government will protect the farmers in Scotland. The involvement of representatives from across the UK at Brexit talks is crucial. Today, the, new, the newly appointed UK Rural Affairs Secretary, Michael Gove, was due to chair the EU Transition Forum, where farming ministers from across the UK discussed the future of the industry after Brexit. In instead, he decided not to attend. I fully realise the impact that failings in the delivery of CAP payments has on, had on farmers. And in my region in the south of Scotland, we have the President and Vice President of the National Farmers Union who both farm in Galloway. So I would like to end by reassuring the farmers that the Scottish Government will continue to work flat out and that I will be con continuing to listen and support the farmers if needed. Thank you very much, Ms Harper. Uh, winding up speeches, I call on Jackie Bailey to close for Labour. Four minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I start by congratulating Jamie Halker Johnson on his maiden speech and also acknowledge the contribution of his father to public life. Um, he has big shoes to fill. Um, Presiding Officer, I think it is safe to say that I am a city girl, but always willing to learn, so I pay tribute to the NFU Scotland members in my constituency who over the years have tried terribly hard to educate me. I now know the difference between tops and yows. I have spent time on their farms. I have grown to understand just how hardworking and creative my local farmers have had to be over the years. Diversifying what they do, challenging the supermarkets when milk prices have been less than the cost of production, and working with really tight margins. So they have my complete respect, and they therefore do not deserve having others fail them. And let's be clear, this is the third year in a row that the IT system designed to make the payments has been in trouble. And whilst the loan scheme put in place is indeed very welcome, the reality is that it's only there because of the government's failure. Now, I always listen very carefully to what Fergus Ewing says. I know he inherited this mess, so I have a degree of sympathy. And as we've already heard from others, you know, Fergus Ewing may be a man of few words, but he makes them count. In May 2016, he said, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I address three 
simple words to all farmers and crofters who have suffered as a result. We are sorry. Let me follow that up, he said, with four further words. We are fixing it. A direct quote from Fergus Ewing. It was to be his first and foremost priority. He told us that he would do three things, complete the 2015 payments, deliver compliance and minimize any financial penalties, and to see the 2016 payments placed on a proper footing. He was going to oversee and drive forward work to get things back on an even keel. Sticking with his fondness for brevity, let me say three words to the cabinet secretary. You have failed. We have a follow-up report from Audit, Audit Scotland, which does not make for very positive reading. The programme that originally costed 178 million, now likely to cost an additional 33 million, and with potential fines of 60 million. And I think Audit Scotland was being unduly kind when they said, to date, the programme has not delivered value for money. I think that passes as the understatement of the year. The independent technical report commissioned by the government is shrouded in secrecy. Now, members of the Public Audit Committee and the Rural Economy Committee were given a private briefing, but actually this should be available to the entire parliament to scrutinize. And I know the cabinet secretary is trying to make that information available and today sent an email to both committees including that, and that, that is welcome. But given that the entire report is in the hands of the Herald, he should really consider full publication to this parliament. I suspect, presiding officer, it's a case of too little, too late. Can I conclude, presiding officer, by saying that farmers and crofters have been ill-served by this government and their mishandling of the CAP Futures IT programme. There is a level of incompetence here that is breathtaking and farmers are no clearer about whether payments will arrive when they should in 2017. Indeed, across a number of schemes, the less favoured area scheme, payments of 12 million, outstanding. The hill sheep scheme, 6 million, outstanding. I could go, go on, but I suspect the presiding officer won't let me. So let me finish with, the SNP do need to get a grip. Let me leave you with the words of someone I don't often quote. We're talking about public money and people's livelihoods. We need something far better. This performance is not acceptable. That was Alex Neil in December 2016, and he was right. You know me so well, Ms. Bailey. Uh, call Fergus, you Cabinet Secretary. Five minutes, please. Uh, well, I've, I've uh, found this debate interesting, uh, uh, difficult at times, but interesting, and I, I would uh, echo the Congratulations to Jamie Halcrow Johnson for his excellent uh, and dignified maiden speech. And I'm absolutely certain, presiding officer, that he will make his influence felt in this place and beyond, and not just in the tug of war team. Um, I've also listened with care to the contributions of members throughout the chamber, and uh, it behoves me to reply to the main points, uh, a cognizant of the fact that, as Mr. Finney pointed out, I will be before the Rural Committee next week as well, responding, as is my duty, to individual questions. And I think I, I have been as transparent as possible in attending the Rural Committee and answering its questions. Um, so uh, let me first deal with the CAP IT programme and the issues that members have raised about the Audit Scotland and the Fujitsu report. First of all, I welcome the Audit Scotland report. It underlines what I have said on many occasions that we still have work to do. I have been transparent about that, and I point out, presiding officer, that information about the precise performance of payments is made, made available on a weekly basis to a, the Parliament, and rightly so. A, the report, the, the Auditor General's report, does note that significant progress has been made over the past year, and I think it's reasonable that I narrate some of that progress in order to have a balanced record. There have been, according to the Auditor General, significant and positive changes to both the leadership and governance of the programme. I know that. I ordered them. The team has changed. The governance has changed. Secondly, there has been progress, as the Auditor General recognises, on managing the contracts. I have met personally with uh, Steve Thorne, in person or, or digitally through video conferences on numerous occasions, I believe five occasions, uh, these discussions and work that officials have done has resulted in a 4.4 million reduction in costs to the taxpayer. 
Thirdly, the Auditor General recognises, as I think Stuart Stevenson pointed out first in this debate, that there has been increasing success with the online uh, SAF application process. That is functioning properly. Next, we are making progress on payments, as I alluded to in an intervention to Claudia Beamish, with over 99% of BPS 2015 payments made. And I should explain, presenting officer, that in every year there is a tail of applications which for one reason or another cannot uh, be met. This year the tail has been bushier, but there, is always, there are always some applications that cannot be met. Uh, but that's no excuse for not ensuring that our job is done. And uh, whilst uh, I think Rhoda Grant credited me with Teflon shoulders, uh, uh, which is an amusing phrase, I, I don't shirk responsibility. I intend to see the job through. So we are making progress on payments, but we are not there yet. I also disagree with some parts of the report, and I have made that disagreement to, uh, clear to the, to the Auditor General. For example, on penalties and disallowances, the figure of 60 million pounds presenting officer that's quoted is entirely speculative, as the report notes just as the figure of more than double that quoted last year was entirely speculative. The Fujitsu, I don't think I can, I'm very sorry because I've got quite a lot to cover, I'm very sorry. Uh, I'll see you in committee next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, members have raised the Fujitsu report and I want to publish it in full. I cannot do so because of the advice I've received that to do so would threaten cybersecurity. I did reply and complied in full with the approach that was suggested by Jackie Bailey as convener of the audit committee who said publish either a redacted version or publish a, a, a summary of its findings and today we published the key findings. So I have complied exactly, well I'm very sorry I can't, it's just time presenting officer, I, I can't reply but I, well no I can't because I've got more to cover. I have complied. Actually the cabinet secretary is in his last minute. I have complied precisely if the letter from Papel convener is read with exactly what they asked me to do. That report, however, does state that the IT architecture is fundamentally sound. Signing so, officer, there's many more opportunities that we need to discover. What happens in the event of a Brexit? What about the points that Mr Finney made, that Emma Harper made, about the real challenges facing the rural economy? What about the convergence funds due to Scotland, £190 million, not passed on by the UK government? I raised that yesterday with Mr Gove, uh, and he has undertaken to reply to me on that. But as my time is drawing to an end, presiding officer, I apologise that I'm not able to answer all the questions. I will do so next week, as is my job. But just let me say this, that we are in the course of fixing it. We have made substantial progress. The technical experts report says the system is fundamentally sound. It delivered 99% plus of the applications last year. It proceeded with the applications on time. It is proceeding and helping us make loan payments, which members have welcomed. We are fixing it, but the job is not done yet. But I fully intend, presiding officer, both to accept my responsibility and to see the job through. Uh, thank you. Um, I now call Alexander Burnett to close for the Conservatives till five o'clock, please, or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I start by noting my register of interest around farming and confirm that I do not receive any rural farm payments. Before I come to today's debate on the failures of the SNP, the Scottish Government and Fergus Ewing surrounding cap payments, can I welcome Jamie Halker Johnston to the Chamber and congratulate him on such a fantastic maiden speech. As a proud Orcadian, he will be a welcome addition in standing up for our rural and remote communities and his presence due to the election of Douglas Ross to Westminster was a clear message of dissatisfaction with the SNP's performance in Murray. A fact that must make our former Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead justifiably nervous given today's debate. Yeah. Now on cap payments, and here we are again, a five-year project, two Cabinet Secretaries, and we are still no closer to a functioning payment system, to summarise Rhoda Grant and Jackie Bailey, which is why we will be supporting their amendment. In the latest Audit Scotland report, its conclusion was that we face risks of European fines as the system is not compliant. Fines can be administered for failing to make the required payments within set timescales, 
misinterpreting or breaching regulations, weaknesses in financial and administrative controls that are considered a risk to EU funds, and there is a real risk of this occurring. For a system that cost 178 million and managed to be 75% over budget, to say that we haven't had value for money would be an understatement. Of course, Audit Scotland had warned the Scottish Government then that this would not deliver value for money, and unsurprisingly, they refused to listen. And as of the latest figures provided on the 9th of June, 6,725 applications were still to be processed. All of this leads to one thing, additional costs. We are left with a system that has been, merely been papered over as the structure of payments collapses underneath it. Farmers are still left without a significant amount of Pillar 2 money from 2015. Around £14 million worth is currently sitting in Butte House rather than in the Brock, Barrow or the Borders. So whilst my colleague Peter Chapman opened with, the Scottish Government is at risk of a £60 million fine in fines from the EU, but the First Minister doesn't seem to be overly concerned. Why? Because that's enough for over 2,000 teachers for our rural schools which are crying out for staff. Now we also heard today from Stuart Stevenson, who as usual was more concerned with Westminster than the matter of hand. We heard from Claudia Beamish, who raised the important consequentials of this failure, from businesses failing to the mental health of farmers, a subject not nearly discussed enough. And we also heard from Emma Harper, who gave an acknowledgement that the government will consider the report. And I hope they do so soon, because at the very earliest, it is anticipated that the rural payment system will not be fully operational until 2018. Meaning that this time next year, we will be realising Mike Rumble's fears and having the same debate again, asking the Scottish Government again if they have done any work into a penalties assessment, asking the Scottish Government again if a Pillar 2 payments have been met, asking the Scottish Government again if it's had to paper over cracks again with short-term loans. And Finlay Carson summed up the fiasco well. Our farmers and crofters are paying the price for this SNP's government continued mismanagement. But the problems are not just external. As Peter Chapman mentioned, we are now at risk of staff burnout. Staff are being put under enormous pressure for another year for shortcomings that had nothing to do with them. The 2016 report found that IT division and programme team do not work as one, an area that John Finney touched on. Administrative problems have also led to some farmers receiving duplicate payments, valued at just under £490,000, adding a further administrative cost for recovery. Presiding officer, it is clear, the SNP simply doesn't care about rural Scotland. And it is no wonder that rural Scotland sent them a message earlier this month. Their safer seats turning blue in order to put some proper pressure on this incompetent government. Because when it should have been sorting this mess out, its mind was on one thing only, furthering their cause of independence. So to finish, presiding officer, I would like to note what local farmers ask me about the First Minister. They ask, what will it take her for to consider her position on the matter? And on the eve of the Royal Highland Show, it is certainly a fair question. Thank you. Thank you very much and that concludes our debate on agriculture.